Dr. Dillo, I wish I had done something with uh, the menti.com thing, but I will leave it for another lecture. I'm eager to think how am I going to use this. Uh, are, are we going to have the, the clock there? I mean, if, thank you. So, <laughs> um, so I believe, uh, and many people do believe, we're in challenging times for science. We see things like the anti-vaccine movements in the 21st century, which is something that we should not be expecting to have. We have climate change science denials. And some people say of a general cries of trust in science, and that has some relations to all the fake news and, and, and all kinds of things that. And it's also challenging times for Brazilian science in particular, not to mention a uh, uh, crisis in funds that we are going through. At the same time, throughout our society, we, we see something that people are beginning to call a, a general digitalization of uh, 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 the human enterprise in all kinds of services and, and activities. And this is digitalization provides both opportunities and also risks for every, every, in every field, but also in science. For instance, a, a website that I like very much, I don't have the, the, we're all here is, but you can type in Google, spurious correlations. And this, what this website does, it finds time series of very different data and they combine it together when they have very good correlation. So you find something that's something that's like the the I think the 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 United States budget for research in the health science correlates with the number of uh Al Pacino movies uh, per year or something like that. Uh, so it's a very fun, fun uh, 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 website, but it underlies the fact that if we are not cautious, then the old saying that giving in any data you can prove anything can become a problem and a concern these days. Of course, we are in the midst of, of all the Cambridge Analytica and Facebook kind of things, so it brings to our minds and, and the, the public, general public discussions, the worries that we must have in the digitalization process for science. Beside of that, we need to solve some grand challenges in humanity right now. These challenges, are, I think, are elegantly presented as, uh, as the sustainable development goals proposed uh, by the United Nations. And in that, many experts would cite that uh, we need uh, for transdisciplinary science and uh, uh, something that was pointed out in, in some way by this morning by, okay, thank you, uh, by Professor Barreto from Fidel Cruz this morning. Uh, perhaps there is a need and a time to bring science to the 21st century. And, and in saying that, uh, I must point out that perhaps we don't have to wait for science, the current sciences to retire. Science is uh, increasingly a group endeavor, and perhaps we should target this research group and, uh, uh, and, and, and have trust in the uh, knowledge diffusion capabilities. Another thing that we underestimate, the current sciences here, the current uh, 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 let's say senior professors in this room, they, they actually had to walk to the library to find their articles. They, they, so they have seen already some, some changes in their, in their, their, in their careers at science. And, and, and I think they cope it very well. So we, I think we can have some trust in that. Well, we also see a moving ground in, uh, scientific publishing. Uh, of course, open access is part of that, and, and in the broader sense, open science, open research data. But also, we see some price increases in 
uh, uh, the access for scientific publications. And rightly so, we see now some disputes on, on, on subscription prices and things like that, like the recent news that France is disputing the, the, the prices for Springer and, and other, other uh, countries are, are, are finding it hard to justify the high cost for publishing. One, one thing that I, that I saw is, uh, was hard to justify the fact that a publisher, they had opened up the access for a number of their, uh, journals, but let's say 10%, but did, 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 that did not translate immediately to a lower 10% in the package subscription that was done. Um, so, Perhaps it's time to rethink knowledge diffusion for science as a whole. A researcher from California, uh, Brett Victor, points out that the book, as we currently know it, was not a immediate consequence of the printing press by Gutenberg. It took a couple centuries to for the world to arrive to the book that we know today. So perhaps the same thing will happen with uh, uh, with science. We have now all these tools provided by digitalization, but we perhaps haven't arrived yet on the tool that we'll see in the future for scientific knowledge diffusion. There is, of course, uh, 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 initiatives like the Jupyter notebooks or the proposition of the Mathematica notebooks, but perhaps we're not there yet. One thing is certain. Uh, 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 and some people begin to talk about a, a reproducibility crisis in sciences, so others are skeptical about it. But one thing is certain, uh, uh, today for uh, a big part of science, not only the text, the explanation is important, but also the data, also the code, and also the methods need to be addressed and, and they, they have to reach the other scientists in a, a, a clear, precise, and, and, and open manner to everybody else. Uh, uh, this is to say perhaps we need to rethink the whole scientific endeavor. But I think it's, it's, it's a little beyond of what we're doing here. So more specifically, and, and talking about what's happening in Brazil. Well, we see uh, the open uh, research data uh, question is something that's in the context of what we have for uh, uh, open data, open public data. And so in that context, we have had a law since 2012 that that was mentioned before, that's the, the access to information law. Uh, we have a national policy for government data. And also we have a national infrastructure for open that data. And even from before the law, there has been a national infrastructure for geospatial data, the INDE. So we understand that uh, open public research data to be part of that context, but we also understand that uh, the scientific community and the scientific endeavor has specific needs that should be met if we were to propose a national policy on research data. So uh, uh, we have several questions at this point, not many answers, and that's part of being here and in, in, in hearing all of you. And these questions, they relate both to open data and also to open science. First of all, one, uh, one it's what's our role as a ministry of science and technology innovation and now communication. Uh, uh, and what are, are the roles of our apartment, partner and affiliated institutes? So you see here talks by the National Research uh, Network, or uh, RNP, which is working together with IBIC, to the National Institute of uh, science, science and Technology Information. Uh, we have been talking with Fiocruz in their uh, uh, with SIDAX, we understand that every possible the, the high challenges that Fiocruz may have in their in their uh, uh, pursuit of open science, it will be probably as difficult as it is for them than for anybody else. I mean, 
their privacy requirements are the highest, their, 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 their volume in data is very big, and so on and so forth. So uh, there is a role loss for, for funders. I'm eager to listen to what Professor Bowser Medeiros is about to say uh, right now. <laughs> And, and our questions, they relate to institutional roles, uh, the intervention units where uh, 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 the, the handling of all these questions should be located. Uh, we have seen questions related to when to invest in domain-specific repositories against uh, uh, more general repositories. Those should be national, international, institutional, these kind of questions. There is clearly a need for coordination and, and, and forums like these. Uh, I mean, we saw yesterday in real time the benefits of having things like this happening on the soil, on the soil session, where we saw that happen right here in front of everybody. So, so there is certainly a need for things like what we're doing right now. Well, skills, teams, services to need to be provided, who's going to provide them, how, where they're organized, how that's related to the service provided to existing libraries. These are all sorts of questions. And of course, this leads to funding and incentives. We have to make sure that the way we provide funding is not a barrier to open science and open research data. Uh, uh, that's something I think that uh, was pointed out by a comment by uh, Dr. Nikolai da Costa from the National Observatory when he said, well, how about the, 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 the process where people is, are, uh, is hired and, and, and promoting the institutions that the way we do that, if we're only doing counts of articles, that could be a barrier for the development of open science and for the availability of open research data. So th this ties to evaluation. Of course, we're talking about Brazil, so bureaucracy, external auditing, and legal worries is, is something that's on the table and unfortunately on the minds of, I would say, every researcher in this country, unfortunately. And uh, not, and finally, not a small task of providing infrastructure. So we see a little bit of the work of the RNP, as I said. And, and broadly speaking, we have to think also about our capabilities as producers of data, but also uh, our capabilities as consumers of data. I mean, uh, yesterday in the Glacier data presentation, uh, we didn't see Brazil as a, a producer of data. I think we're not there in the, the, the red reason. I, I think we haven't found the Brazilian Glacier yet. Perhaps it's there somewhere. But I'm certain that uh, that's a data that's very viable for our uh, uh, climate scientists, and, and we should be able to consume that data as well as produce it. Uh, there is uh, 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 one thing that I saw from a presentation by Luis Fernando Sayon from the National uh, Atomic and Energy Commission. He said something that says, some people say, well, the same way we, we have specimens that were preserved in the 19th century and now we're doing DNA, we have to think of data with, as having the potential of being uh, uh, analyzed in the future with techniques that we do not know yet. And, and, and that's something that we have to think on where funding those endeavors, and we are not doing this just for ourselves, we're doing this for the future as well. Um, uh, in all of this, we have to think of all news mean, uh, new means of knowledge diffusion, of peer review, etc., assuring openness and excellence. So I thank you everybody for, for this forum. It's been very, uh, uh, there's been great two days. Uh, we do believe there is a central role for our host, the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. Nothing that we do at the ministry will work if it's not embraced by the scientific community. So thank you very much.
thank you very much, Roberto, um, for your words. Um, I think we have time for one question, uh, but please remember that we will have a panel discussion at the end. So um, and only if it's a burning question. Otherwise, we can defer it to later. No burning questions? Okay, so l keep your, uh, your steam for the last part of the panel. Uh, Roberto, you, you can stay here if you want. Yeah. Um, if it were a burning question, I would just run. You run, okay. <laughs> Our second, uh, yeah, that's the, the buzzer. Our second speaker is Claudia Medeiros. Um, and Claudia is um, working at FAPES, the research program on, uh, the research program on e-science and, si uh, and data science. Uh, FAPES is a funding um, research funder uh, for the state of Sao Paulo. Can I, I will go there just uh, okay, to see the, the thing. Yeah, and then you'll come. So, um, and, your, and her presentation uh, is collaborating through data um, from data intensive research to data management policies. Yeah, uh, I just before I start counting my time, how do I deal with this contraption since I used to go to paper libraries <laughs> so uh, and even use the post office? Yeah. <laughs> oh, so that, okay, thank you. And, and the pointer is the red one here. Oh, I don't use the pointer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm old. Yeah. Okay. So, um, first of all, thank you very much for, so it's counting now. Yeah. Thank you very much for this invitation. This has been a great meeting and I, I learned a lot. And I'm going to present, uh, what we are doing at FAPESP from, uh, two perspectives. Um, one is the FAPESP perspective, but also the other one is my perspective as a data researcher. And for those who do not know, FAPESP is a funding agency for researchers who uh, work at the state of Sao Paulo, who are based at the state of Sao Paulo, and it receives approximately 27,000 uh, proposals per year, receives and processes, okay, in, in all fields. So, um, so this talk is divided in uh, three parts. The first part is my personal view of collaborating through data. Um, I believe uh, firmly in using data as a means, as a basis of establishing uh, multidisciplinary collaborations. Uh, it's either lots of people with different views looking at the same file with different demands or many people, each one with different domains and from different fields, discussing how they treat their data from collection to, well, data death, if you can call it like that, but anyways, to preservation and, and reuse. So as you learn how people treat their data, you learn how they work, and it's easier to collaborate through data. The second point is my role as the uh, coordinator of the FAPESP Science and Data Science Program, um, which, as you know, is very data intensive, uh, and uh, these data needs uh, prompted and, uh, us at FAPESP to go towards data management policies. So, first, uh, the e-science uh, e research the program started in 2014, and uh, we have uh, and we are financing uh, projects in archaeology, in the humanities, in medicine, in health, and anything that requires collaboration of computer scientists with other fields, and uh, where where both learn and conduct research. And uh, there is a new call uh, as of April 16, and we have the culture. And uh, this is what it is not just plants and animals, it's requiring networks of expertise in several fields, such as food sciences, agricultural sciences, Internet of Things, environmental science, social science, biological sciences. Anything that has to do to producing food, supply chains, from inside the farm, but also outside the farm, logistics, and so on. 
And of course, there is this big computer science and, um, research that connects things, but for me, data is the glue. So how do you propose these multidisciplinary projects involving people from so many fields? I mean, it's not required that all these fields are involved, but when you talk about the agriculture, it has potential for these and many others. So given this uh, scenario, which is just an example of Alpha Plus program, how did we come to uh, start with being one of the first agencies, and as far as I know, in the country, or even in, in South America, to actually implement data management policies, data management plans? This is the scenario. Uh, there are other FAPES programs, such as biodiversity, climate change, bioenergy, and the code of good practices that was established in uh, 2011 that actually says that results of public research should be made public. And uh, as long as other considerations that we mentioned before are considered. Then we have uh, treaties with about 120 international collaborators, entities both as funding agencies or countries, which more and more require in the joint calls that we provide and we produce data management policies for the projects that are approved. And the third element in this uh, combination of factors that prompted us to start creating data management policies is this group of agencies plus Belmont Forum plus others and uh, I'll give a few examples, um, especially RDA is not just a three-letter uh, acronym. It's a, a natural institution that's helping us a lot. So um, what were the initiatives that started in 2017? Two initiatives establishing data management policy were the first branch is that all large projects that last over five years have um, to be submitted together with a data management plan. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute. And the second thing is, okay, if the data management plan requires you as a researcher to deposit your data and you don't know where you can deposit your data, then your university has to provide you with infrastructure. But what if the university does not have the infrastructure? So for plus created the right side, a working group with seven public universities, that, whose goal is to establish a network of uh, research data depositories, public and open. So uh, this is the only thing I want to say about the data management policy, it's all on this page, but only in Portuguese, and it states that data produced as part of a project financed by public money, in particular by FAPOSP, is a public good and should be made publicly available. And uh, the rest of this page describes requirements for data management plans with lots of examples. What I would really like to talk about in the seven minutes that remain are the, uh, what this data repository network, these are the seven universities that participate in it, uh, involving approximately 48 campi, um, oh my god, I have to take my glasses off, 11,000 faculty, 170,000 students, and though its mission was just to establish a network. It also is handling and worrying about training and changing the culture of researchers, of librarians, of staff. So, um, whoops. 
this is the first decision that we, we uh, took is that each university, this is going to be a coalition, and each university will have the infrastructure and provide the infrastructure as it decides, with each university having its own policy. And it's been uh, designed so that any institution can join the network. And um, at the same time, on the right side, uh, there's going to be a metadata uh, engine that will retrieve metadata from to create a metadata catalog. Now, I put the IDA logo on top because we used our contacts and knowledge generated by IDA, so we would not start from zero. We are following steps of people and entities that have been developing these networks, these repositories, for 10 years. I would like to publicly uh, thank Ingrid because her staff, when I talk about staff, she has over 200 people, right? And more than that? 1,500 people. 50. No. Well, they look like they are 1,500 because they are so helpful uh, and give us advice, and so do other national networks through RDA. They are very efficient, yeah. Um, so um, there are a few uh, studies on how we are conducting choices for each university what kind of software it's going to use, what kind of architecture, what kind of policy. But one interesting thing is that the group is conducting a study on the ease for scientists to use these open platforms versus the ease for people to implement new facilities in these platforms. And we come to our first choice which is, uh, we decided to use, adopt that for every data uh, set, uh, scientific data file that is deposited anywhere in these universities, the scientist has to provide seven metadata fields. Which, uh, and the choice of these fields are based on a study conducted within the group um, on over 50 different repositories all over the world. But there were seven, and now there's an eight field that arose out of RDA contacts. Uh, a month ago, I talked to the people responsible for the Australian uh, National uh, Ends Center, and uh, we discussed some of our choices with, with him, and he, and he said, you should adopt another field type. If you do not choose it right now, you will need it in three years. So why not jump over three years of, you know, being frustrated for ignoring the need for it? All the rest is fine. And you are at the stage we were ten years ago. But you have the advantage that you not commit the same mistakes that we committed because you learn from us and from other people in RDA or and in the other coalitions. So, um, and they, he said, and we will learn from you. So uh, I'm looking forward to committing lots of mistakes so that RDA members will learn from us. Well, not really, but anyways. So this is the first prototype interface. It's not supposed to be beautiful. Uh, and it's closed, but it works in the sense that it harvests metadata from different installations using different software with a common protocol. And it even harvests metadata from other countries. It's just under test, but this all started uh, in July last year, the first meeting of July last year. So we're advancing pretty fast. And the main results, uh, political results, so I say each university of these seven universities has created its own data management office or a group 
because all the university administrations have decided that data is a priority. And uh, this is being stated now because, among other things, FAPESP is pressuring the researchers, and the researchers are pressuring the universities. So there is always this intention of doing this, but now there is a real need. From FAPESP, uh, since data management plans became compulsory, uh, since November last year, 100 big projects have been submitted, and 80% of these have been approved by reviewers uh, as being okay, reasonable data management plans. Um, internal challenges to build this, start this work at FAPES was, well, Brazilian culture, internal processes, and Brazilian law. So lots of these regulations had to be adapted to meet the requirements of Brazilian legislation. And now we are thinking, oh my God, well, Amanda, one minute. We are going, we are going through a process of studying how to train reviewers to understand what a data management plan is, creating a viable monitoring mechanism for the projects. Each project has a reviewer. How can you monitor whether the data promised are going to be delivered and stored as promised? And also linking the data produced to the public uh, database. FAPESP has a database which you can access online of all projects it has ever funded in its 55 years. And, what, and once you click on a project, you see the publications, you see the researchers, you see the network. What we now want is that when you click on a project, you also find out which data it has produced and stored. So this is going to be part of it. And external challenges are basically changing the culture, checking compliance, and the different kinds of university policies, and the level of support staff we have. My thanks to all of these institutions that have been cooperating with us from Canada, from the Netherlands, from Auckland, from all over, uh, and through RDA, especially RDA, that um, has helped us a lot. And thank you. If you want to know me about the best business, the first email, if you want to know me about my research, about UNICAMP, about anything else, the second email. Do not send me private email to send me there or something. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. I'm sorry if I... Okay. No, it's not okay because uh, I, I'm very strict. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. And again, we have time for a burning question. And Claudia will not run if uh, there's a burning question, <laughs> hopefully. Oh, there's a burning question. Wow. It has to be short, huh? Hi, Claudia. Well, I would like to know if it's there is a space to join another university on the seventh one, the, the seventh you mentioned. For instance, a university from Rio de Janeiro. Anybody can join, but not the meetings. Because, uh, you know, uh, we cannot meet and discuss technical issues. Uh, in a group like that. So, uh, as you can use our metadata, as long as you say, I'm going to exploit it, as soon as we do not have only a prototype. Okay, because otherwise, but if you want to be part of our test, uh, uh, group, you're very welcome. Okay, contact me. For press BR. <laughs> Thank you very much, Claudia. Our, um, Third panelist is Leonardo Sufo from RNP, and he will talk to us about RNP support to data-driven research. Thank you, Mustafa. Okay, okay. Um, well, I'm going to share. Well, we're talking here about sharing data, and I will share the presentation with Professor uh, Sonia Tarinato. So hopefully, we will speak in seven minutes, and I will hand over to to her. Okay. So. Uh, well, for the benefit of audience that doesn't know RNP, so RNP 
is the is Brazilian National Research and Education Network. Is an organization, a non-profit organization, supervised by the Ministry of Science and Technology. And RNP connects uh, currently more than 1,500 uh, campi universities. So, uh, roughly speaking, uh, RNP is a, an internet provider, academic internet provider. So we are most well known by, by this, by this uh, a network, this high-speed network to support research and education. And as a, like an uh, uh, operator, <laughs> uh, we have also international connections. Here's on the left-hand side some of the international connections of this high-speed network to, uh, to USA and coming soon. <laughs> Uh, thanks to new submarine cables on the uh, construction direct uh, links to Africa and, and Europe. Well, and uh, it's important to say that organizations like RNP, uh, uh, National Research and Education Networks, they exist in several countries and they collaborate among them to share infrastructure, their infrastructure for uh, science. So this is a uh, uh, global uh, uh, map of uh, this, uh, all these uh, academic networks and how they, they, they share their, their infrastructure for this internet for, for research, let's say. And, uh, well, we, uh, 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 there are some, a group of projects, very high demanding projects, that are the ones who most benefit from this high speed network. So, uh, this morning, uh, we have presentations that mention, uh, the Large Hadron Collider in, in Europe from, from the high energy physics uh, domain. Also, big telescopes. We have, uh, uh, presentations here from LSST. So, there are very big projects that consume the need uh, network. Actually, they, they drive the evolution of the network, uh, this kind of projects. And also to have an example here in Brazil, uh, we are supporting, uh, uh, uh uh, a single time light source uh, based in Campinas to uh, push data to a supercomputer center in Petropolis uh, from the National Laboratory of Scientific Computation, LNCC, which is one of the supporters of this event, uh, by the way. So, but, uh, well, this is a, a well known uh, picture. Uh, these big projects they are in the, in the head of the, this plot. They are the, the, on the left-hand side, but we also need to support these one-pair uh, researchers. And, uh, and, and, and the researchers that are, that are in, the, in the long tail, they also have needs for moving data. Uh, I saw some presentations here and uh, uh, about some repositories, and uh, perhaps if your repository is uh, based locally, inside an university, I mean, only for use inside an university or inside, inside of a company, or if your data set is only based on text files or spreadsheets, you may not um, perceive uh, the need of a high-speed network. But there are many uh, uh, research domains that they, 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 their data set are not so huge as the one here, but uh, they have some some hundred megs, and it's uh, they may face problems in moving the, that data. And uh, so, if you are a researcher uh, that uh, have this problem, you may have faced it like this once. Uh, uh, this doing an analogy with uh, water pipes uh, is very often a researcher in the lab is expecting to take a, a bucket to 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 get the, the water, the data, and he actually get this, some drops in the cup. So this is very common. Uh, some researchers approach us saying, how come I have run, uh, 10 gig connection in my lab and I only can download with 20 megabits per second. So RNP is a, 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 a network organization. We have a, a, a problem, ah, by the way, this is only for reference. A uh, nice plot that show theoretically <laughs> how, uh, uh, how, uh, uh, I mean, uh, if you need to move this size of data in this time, uh, which bandwidth you need. So, this slide will be available for downloading, just for reference. Uh, 
so let me just put here. Uh, I will come back. So we have a program to evangelize uh, IT managers in, inside the universities to uh, try to in, uh, uh, increase the, 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 the perception of, of, let's say, the velocity of the network. So the Science DMZ program, just to explain briefly, this uh, usually is how a campus network looks like. So we have uh, uh, inside the campus network, uh, all kind of users, they are behind a, a strong, a very strong IT uh, policy, security policy. I mean, uh, either uh, students using Wi-Fi, academic systems, or uh, research facility or data repository. And uh, well, what we're trying to uh, to change the campus is uh, researchers that they have special needs for moving data, they're not they should not be treated like uh, the regular users. I mean, they should have a, a, a side, a separated uh, high-speed network for them. So uh, we have to do this program. Uh, we selected uh, six uh, campuses in Brazil to experiment this uh, architecture, and uh, and uh, we are supporting them to install this kind of uh, data transfer node and. This might be very useful also to connect to data repositories inside universities, especially those that uh, wish the data set they need, uh, uh, they are big data sets. So, uh, just for consulting, <laughs> we, we, we have uh, this cookbook explaining how to do this in your campus is in Portuguese and uh, the costs are in, in Brazilian AIs as well. So, so far, I, I talked about our expertise in helping institutions, helping researchers in moving data across network. But RMP, uh, we run regularly uh, some open uh, calls for projects. And uh, last uh, year, uh, we, we ran a project call uh, aiming to build a prototype of a uh, national uh, data service. Okay, uh, by national data service, I'm, I'm saying uh, scientific data, raw scientific data, not, not publications. And in this project, uh, we approached uh, uh, EBICT, uh, which is offering uh, consultancy in this project for us uh, because of their expertise in data management. And we, we run a selection, an open call, and we select uh, some researchers in uh, University of Rio Grande do Sul. And uh, this is a one-year project. And uh, and the first delivery, deliverable of this project was to issue uh, a survey. I mean, as we are talking about uh, a prototype of a, of a, a data service, we run a survey to identify the demand of this kind of service in, in, for the Brazilian researchers. And uh, Professor uh, Professor Sonia will uh, now show some results of this survey, some insights we had, and what are the next steps of this, this project. Seven minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Leandro, for sharing this prestigious and uh, important time slot. So we are partners with the uh, RMP, uh, to do this survey, which I'm showing here today, just a few bits, because um, I think some of you have answered this uh, survey recently. We have still uh, it open, so those of you who haven't answered yet can participate. And since it is still running, I'm just showing you the most important things, demographic things, that we can uh, share at this moment. Uh, of course, this so is a preliminary result. Uh, the survey was directed to Brazilian researchers from all areas of knowledge and all types of institutions, and we aim to assess their views on research data sharing, access, reuse, and management. Uh, the results, of course, as Leandro said, can be used to plan efforts that address the needs for future research data services to create a network of people and institutions and to develop situations for different subject areas. 
uh, methodology. Very, very short. Uh, we invite, uh, we send 72,000, uh, email addresses to research group leaders in Brazil. Uh, this we took from, uh, the directory of research groups from CNPQ. Uh, 20, uh, 249, uh, addresses of coordinators of national institutes of science, uh, from CNPQ as well. And 4,677 address of postgraduate programs, which we took from, uh, Plataforma Sucupira from CAPS. Uh, data was collected between March 13th to April 12th this year. So you, as you can see, uh, these results we closed, uh, just 10 days ago, less than 10 days ago. And we got in a month, uh, 4,703 answers, uh, researchers, uh, uh, of which it, this is very important. We had, we think, a very highly participation, but we think this data uh, it's very important because we asked them if they accepted to carry on, to participate in a carry on interview. And we had 22% of these researchers saying that they would be interviewed by us in a follow up, uh, interview, would be interviewed. Uh, and 1,600, uh, and a bit more said they would like to subscribe to our mailing list. So it means to us that a lot of res Brazilian researchers want to participate, uh, at this moment in this, uh, working with research data. So this is just a, a few bit of the informations I have to share with you today. Uh, as we expected, it 80% of the respondents are professors and researchers from universities, which is the most common place to do research in Brazil. Uh, uh, we also ask them about their uh, subject areas or disciplines. Uh, here I group uh, in broad subject areas to show you. As you can see, we have a uh, the, uh, 21 percent of the researchers coming from the humanities, which is not well represented, uh, today here, uh, and yesterday in this workshop. It means that, uh, we have a lot of scope to work, uh, with this area, uh, followed by uh, exact in earth science, applied science, uh, health science, biological engineering, and, uh, of course, agricultural science. And last but not least, linguistic literature and arts, which is a smaller area, uh, anyway, in Brazil. Work sector, uh, we was asked then, uh, of course, as we expected as well, this is the style of research in Brazil. Most of them come from public universities, but we have also private universities, research institutes, and a few companies. And we still have to look at, at the others. Uh, another question uh, was about data type and formats. And uh, here you see we have uh, different answers, but uh, observational data, experimental data, documental data, uh, and, and interviews are the most common uh, types and formats as mentioned. Sorry. Uh, here is just to, to have a, a, a first, uh, first estimate. Uh, uh, we ask then about the volume of research data per year, storage space, of course, and uh, 35, almost 35% cannot say. They don't know how much space uh, they need uh, to store their data. And 50% uh, seem to need very little space if you compare with data people were telling us yesterday because it's, it's uh, uh, sort of uh, 50 gigabytes is, is the most uh, they cited in that uh, space. Uh, about familiarity research data management, um, uh, again, we expected this, um, uh, 63, uh, percent has, uh, have little knowledge about it and, uh, 23% know nothing about it. 
still we have a very new, very important number. 13% said they are knowledgeable about research data management, which was uh, the question here. And this is the last one. Uh, just because I think everybody is interested in knowing why uh, researchers uh, tend to not share uh, research data. And here we ask them the reasons for not sharing. And it was, of course, a multiple choice uh, answer. And 52% said they need to publish first. That's, that's the first reason given for not sharing data. Uh, the second one, sponsor doesn't require it. So I think the policy, implementing a policy for uh, asking them to, to deposit the data is important. Uh, there is no infrastructure to share them. 31% said that. That's also a very important number to look at. Lack of funding, lack of data standardization. Uh, the data are not fully documented. Uh, I don't have the right to make the data public. I don't know how to make data available and so on. So I think we, this, as I said, are just preliminary data. We still have a lot of work to do to understand according to areas, according to status of the researchers, and we can still uh, cross-check several information. Uh, I think I uh, in this hurry, I didn't tell you. We based our questionnaires in, in uh, international studies. Uh, it has 29 questions. Sorry. Yes, sorry, sorry. There is one more. 29 questions. And those of you who haven't answered yet can go to the, uh, to this address and you, you can see the, all the, um, the, the group that works on this and also find the questionnaire, the survey to answer. Okay. And we hope to make this uh, public, this data public <laughs> to you to extract that's information on that. That's, okay. that's great. Thanks, Sonia and Leandro, for the presentation. We will not take questions now or not even a burning question. Let's keep them for the, the panel discussion. Uh, next. Presentation is from Fabio Porto from LNCC, the Labor Brazilian Laboratorio Nacional de Computação Científica, and his presentation is about scientific data analysis at LNCC towards a generic platform. Hi, thank you, Please, Fabio. Fabio. Good afternoon. So that was actually a broad title. They actually changed while I kind of prepared. Well, we I kept that just to make it match the what was advertised. But anyhow, um, so I'm from Porto, I'm from LNCC. So we are one institute of the Ministry of Science and Technology. And uh, so uh, what I try, so we have many partners. You see here CDAX that we're working with, ISIC, which is also an institute in um, uh, Fiocruz, Linea, uh, in Astronomy, and so on. So actually, uh, this, this foot uh, list of logos give somehow the idea of how we work and how can we contribute to this meeting. So uh, we are in a kind of lucky place in, in between various institutions that are doing the things we saw here these two last days, publishing data and producing data, which is a very strong effort as we've seen. But if somehow uh, with that kind of distant perspective that we have, they share many commonalities and they can actually uh, be enriched by having a global view. So I, I, when I say global view, is I'm saying mo, uh, both in terms of infrastructure and software and, and, and architecture and, and, and data and, and, and software. And I'll try to raise this point through my, um, through my talk, um, which actually goes through these three, uh, three points, LNCC data science initiative and uh, the support. So how do you actually use the data that eventually is going to be uh, published and opened? And then finally, uh, the takeaways. But I'll first do some uh, publicizing in, in something very important. I mean, we are organizing the largest database conference uh, in August here in Rio de Janeiro. So uh, I'll invite you, so we're talking about data and so on, how it's to be managed and so on. So you should um, have a look. Actually, the address of the website is not there, but if you type VLDB 2018, you're going to find it, and uh, it, it should be of interest to you. 
So this LNC is uh, uh, so it's up in uh, 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 in the hills close to Pet uh, to Rio de Janeiro, Petrópolis, and and I actually synthesize what we do, we do many different things in these two aspects which are of re relevance to this meeting. So we coordinate the the Synapad, which is a system that actually puts together huge data processing systems on uh, with HPC capabilities around Brazil. We also coordinate uh, another institute that does uh, uh, um, fosters uh, data science in Brazil. Um, so, talking first about LNCC uh, data science in terms of one of its goals to provide the infrastructure. So, if you want to publish your data, open data, uh, well, um, Leandro just mentioned the HGP and, and, and this infrastructure is uses the HGP. To, um, actually, that was interesting because uh, when we talk when we talk about Synapad, we are mainly told, uh, thinking about HPC applications, applications which are computing intensive. And now we talk a lot about data intensive applications. So how to actually uh, use or use this infrastructure, extend this infrastructure to another kind of application where data is huge. So, uh, I mean, Leandro mentioned uh, previously that uh, experience with the Citadel lab, and, and there is a huge need to transfer a huge amount of data. So, it's not only to make it available on the door, on the interface, but to be, uh, enable, to be able to actually transfer data to actually where it's going to be visualized and analyzed. So, the global view that I mentioned has to do with that. Whenever you put the data on the edges of your uh, institutions, you might, you must have a global view that things, how it's going to be used. How it's going, so that it's not only to access, but to process that data. And that has to do also with the exploratory nature of scientific activities that go beyond that door that I'll uh, talk about. So this is the, 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 um, the HGP with the nodes in yellow, uh, in orange and green, being actually HPC systems that could be used for this national uh, infrastructure for data um, distribution and, and processing. So there is a combination. You, you have data you not only see the data. You actually want to access the data because mostly the research we do starts from that point on. So all the things that Nicolás mentioned today that he has done reductions on data and so forth, um, Mauricio mentioned and linking the data to other data sets, then is to prepare a data set eventually huge to your exploration. And that exploitation might involve a huge processing again that must be inserted into an orchestrated uh, architecture. So it's something that goes beyond the border of each institution somehow. And um, oops. And one of the, uh, the things that LNCC provides is that well, we have this um, the supercomputer, so central demand, which runs currently kind of 80 uh, different projects in different areas, domain areas. But again, that produce data that has to be consumed somewhere else, somewhere, somewhere else, and not in LNCC. And, and and with the huge processing, the oil, for instance, industry has huge data sets, and, and that is a problem. So even if we are able to put it to be on the top of our uh, border from LNCC, how it actually get transferred, how it actually get filtered. So if they are interested in a certain region of space time, how to get that region and so on. So the tools that we have to provide, the infrastructure we have to provide, should be a lot more intelligent, more clever than just like, you know, query like interfaces where you see beautiful things. But this is a very uh, poor kind of, uh, from our point of view, um, consumer interface. But there is this things, there is also a problem of architecture in terms of systems. Not only supercomputers like Central Demand are what we're looking for for each of the research we do. We might have like clusters, big data that have different architectures that must be um, uh, must be um, available in the infrastructure. So this is the the, the first goal. So uh, provide this infrastructure for people uh, to use and consume this open, eventually open data, so on. But also have the methods. So I've been discussing a lot this idea that method uh, methods and algorithms and software are as much important as data. And in some sense, they, they, are, they are very valuable. So imagine that model that we've been training with huge amount of 
meteorological data for forecast, meteorological forecast, that you can just give to somebody to use, that that, that person, that institution will not be able to do it. So there is an equality between uh, data and models. And if you're talking about opening data, we should be thinking also, maybe you already are doing this, um, um, this equation, but I'm just fostering it and enforcing it, that models are as much important as data. So in our INCT, which is an institute, National Institute of uh, Data Science, we have this mission, so we are not only, um, we, we want to prepare people for, for these uh, new challenges involving this huge amount of data that must be analyzed. So there's an aspect on development human resources. And the methods and techniques, so LNCC uh, somehow has these two different heads. We, we provide infrastructure, we actually host um, the clusters for um, the linear project, we, we host the, the cluster for I, uh, ESICT uh, Health um, um, Big Data Platform, but we mostly develop methods that will actually be shared by these different players, different uh, needs. So uh, we are in this somehow good position to see that the same problem arises in those different initiatives. And they are being kind of reconstructing each time, differently, eventually with a richer uh, technology uh, knowledge or, or poor technology. But how, why, why not to actually try to orchestrate this, uh, this, this, this evolution and having something, having something that is more uh, strong and, and, and more persistent through time in, in the software solutions that we are offering. And um, we, we are counting on this um, multidisciplinary. So actually another thing that we see here is that it's basically, so data, open data is also a multidisciplinary um, problem, right? So there is the policy makers that they should say how it should be done. There is the, the, the institutions and the domain uh, people that know the problems and the data that they should uh, provide. And there is the technicians that are developing the models. So data science has also this point of view of uh, multidisciplinarity in another perspective, and I think these two things are, are very well linked. So open data and, and data science are kind of two sides of the same coin somehow. Well, um, so that's the thing to develop techniques and methodologies. Uh, so I think uh, Mauricio mentioned this, using the data, at some, some point in one of the questions he raised last, yesterday. So how do you use the data, right? And, uh, and this is important because there is a huge process. Everyone passes through those somehow different uh, uh, views of those processes to prepare the data and then to analyze the data somehow, training models, and so on. And, um, and, and through that, you also produce different data. So which data do you actually um, publish? Do you publish raw data, intermediate data, tailored data? Uh, yeah, and if you if you if you if you do so in your institution, and someone actually transforms that data using some uh, some uh, analysis, should she also publish that open data that that outcome? So, all, which one of those should come out in, in, in the visible world of open data? And and, and in some sense, um, what we do is constructing knowledge bases. So you want to be. To, to be able to, and this knowledge has to do with data plus methods. That's maybe the, the, the thing here. So we should be able to capture and, and do all the things that we have to do with the raw data and, and processing and linking and um, uh, making anonymous and so on. But then um, the, you must also do this provenance, but also the models that we use that actually explain the data. You mentioned ontologies in some point of uh, the, um, and make, the, and make this understandable and processable. I think this is, so open, open data for me is to be able to, to understand the knowledge that's being brought by, by you know, the set of data sets that actually, um, and, and the knowledge that we shared. So this actually, I, 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 I'm putting a, a, a scientific workflow, uh, Sarah mentioned in his work some, uh, that uh, he's been doing, and he's one of my students. And I, but this is just to illustrate that actually, there's a huge path from the data, from the point where you publish the data to actually get the results that you want. So, and this is enable exploratory research, in silico research. 
So what we're talking about is that research is not more, in, in, you know, in, in vivo is it all in CNET. Right? So you might even be able to express, well, one of my students' thesis was about um, expressing hypotheses as data. Georgia thought a lot about, about that with, with him, but he eventually had the good result. And so actually is to have the whole cockpit in, in, in Sili put, uh, being controlled within certain rules, a certain model, and, and, and I'll enable people to, to produce more knowledge. So uh, be aware that when you produce your data, you, you publish your data, you're actually uh, offering a starting point for something else is very important. So I'm running out of time. So as an example, um, I just want to, sh to share with you one of the systems that we have been developing with people in, in sports science. And what I think is interesting is that, first of all, sports science is very heterogeneous. It, it, it integrates biochemistry, biomechanics, nutrition, and, and different disciplines in order to have the perspective of the athlete. You can actually uh, replace athlete by patient. It's very similar in some sense. So the, the thing is that you want to have this different perspective, and in the essence, you have you understanding that individual in its own characteristics. And this brings a lot of issues in terms of data preparation, data capturing in different sensors, and so all those things. And eventually this ends up in certain multidimensional data uh, storage where you can analyze that data from different perspectives. Then mostly what you want to do is to actually prove hypothesis. How this runner can improve his, in two minutes uh, his time, so how should we interfere in eventually some biochemistry characteristics so that he can or she can improve her results. So then, we, well, we can do some um, some supervisor, but it's not interesting. I'm just saying that this process, it's done um, again and again through all, most of the, uh, the initiatives that we've been seeing, so which is to bring data from raw, from certain states, let's say, transform it, enhance it, towards the target you're looking for, and then produce your research. So main takeaways. Um, data management is a multidisciplinary field, so it's like in data science as well. Uh, the long path needs infrastructure, so there is infrastructure in place, but it has to be thought to, towards data intensive uh, uh, anal analysis and so on. Um, the methods for data preparation are, are those that we've been talking about data manage, but we need something else, which is strategy for in silico that can come can go from hypothesis specification to all the steps to uh, until its validation and the, the sharing of that discovery. So uh, LNCC Data Science in the sense is an initiative to help building up this castle. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio. Um, we will move to our last speaker, and for Juan Ne Wong from the Institute of Geographic Science and Natural Resources Research in China. So we're changing completely com continent here, and uh, Juan Ne will talk to us about the experience of several data centers in China, uh, WDS members uh, in China, and activities towards establishing a common clearinghouse. Please, Juan Ne. Thanks, Mustafa. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm John Wang. Uh, I worked in Institute of Geographical Sciences and Nature Resource Research in Chinese Academic Sciences. And this is also my first time to uh, visit in Academic Sciences. So welcome uh, all of you visit Chinese Academic Sciences later. Okay. Uh, I worked in WCRE, one World Data Center in WDS family. Uh, but here, on behalf of WDS China, so I want to introduce a whole picture of our work at present. So firstly is uh, WDS China Data Center's activities. Uh, here is a picture for all the World Data System Data Center's uh, distribution. Uh, you can see there are nine, but eight uh, in China mainland. Uh, here is the location in China. Uh, most of them in Beijing, uh, 
here, and the one is Tianjin, and the one is Lanzhou in west of China, and the one in Shanghai, but the potential for application uh, for polar research yeah, in Shanghai. So most of them in, in, in Beijing. Uh, I also uh, gave a poster outside the room uh, to show all the uh, what the uh, centers in China their uh, information. Yeah, uh, here is a simple list for the eight centers. I want to give maybe one for thirty seconds to introduce that, them. Yeah, one by one. So the one is Chinese uh, astronomy data center. It's located in Beijing in uh, astronomy uh, station in, in, uh, in Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, you can see they have a, a lot of data holding yeah, for astronomy film, and uh, they make some uh, digital digitization to put data uh, for long time, long term uh, preserve. And also they, they have some training for students, for universities. To make the science be popular, okay. Uh, it's uh, fantastic. Uh, yes, in last year the Iran Iraq earthquake occurred. So this data center have the cloud infrastructure to help our people use satellite data in, in through their platform. So they did put uh, the data service in this field. Okay, the second is the uh, uh, Spatial Science Data Center. Uh, it also hosted by Chinese Academic Sciences. Uh, it have, uh, you can see, 13 integrated database. Uh, they have uh, cooperation in, 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 in China and outside. Uh, firstly, you can see they have the strategic uh, priority program on space science in, in CAS. This program is very big. In case uh, uh, only some some huge uh, project uh, can be supported uh, by by strategic uh, uh, pre priority program, and also they have the international cooperation for space weather uh, maritime circle uh, program, and also I know uh, the Space Science Institute also have cooperation with Brazil for some maybe station some observation station. Okay, thank you. Uh, this uh, WCRE renewable resources and environment. Uh, this uh, is the hosted by by us in 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 our institute. Uh, the, here is the portal, and we also have eight uh, thematic uh, database for for research and environment, and also we host some training workshop every year. Yeah, this year we also will host one. We are October. Uh, we also uh, uh, provide the technical support for the WDS channel uh, clearing house. Uh, you can see uh, different uh, data centers need a portal, need a metadata catalog service. So we do this work for for uh, uh, for our uh, community. Uh, this picture shows uh, the. Uh, some uh, members in China meeting meeting together. You can see uh, this is Guo Qingli, this is Bao Pingyan, and Jiu Lin Sun. This is three generation uh, WDS members <laughs> in in China. They meet together. So, so all of them uh, support uh, this work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what they send for ocean uh, algography at Tianjin? Uh, they also uh, they hosted by a uh, China Ocean uh, Information uh, Ministry. Yeah, uh, uh, they provide the data uh, uh, for monitoring in the ocean and some in national cooperation. Yeah, here yeah. and also WCM for microorganisms. Yeah, uh, this is also one data center in Chinese academic sciences. Uh, uh, they have global level collection for the data and the training uh, workshop every year. You can see there are data uh, members yeah, uh, for uh, uh, more than uh, 40 countries here. And also in, in, in March in this year, 
uh, their work are reported in science. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's very uh, it's a, it's an encouragement for their work, I think. And the code and all the region's science data centers at Landau. Uh, Landau is uh, you know West China is cold and arid area. Uh, and uh, here uh, people use uh, some uh, satellite uh, uh, technology and uh, ground uh, stations to to collect the uh, data in in, in cold and arid area. They they also uh, they also their data centers also are selected. At, Selected as uh, domain depositories for some journals. For example, some journals uh, listed the data centers, so people publish the papers can deposit the data at here. Uh, here is uh, uh, new published data in he in he uh, uh, inland uh, uh, region. So they use uh, ground station, use satellite to make uh, huge bit sites. Uh, Many people use these data. Yeah. Uh, this is what they stand for geographic staging. Uh, they have many co cooperation in the world. I, I, I know um, uh, many colleges in Japan work together for, uh, for two, two mechanism for some uh, seismic data collection and uh, sharing. Uh, here is the uh, data sites they provided and this, and these some um, stations in China uh, collect the, uh, the uh, yeah the geology geology and the seismic data. This one is global change research data publishing and repository. It, it also hosted by uh, our institute. Uh, not only data collection, they also hosted a journal, so data and the people uh, work together, so people can publish paper. And share the data, or, or they also can share the data and publish the data paper here. So the paper is for data paper. Uh, in okay, in this year, uh, I think it's April. Uh, this data center uh, was pri uh, was uh, awarded uh, uh, for WSI WSIS prize. Uh, in information uh, summit uh, for UN, yeah, in in Sweden, I think uh, uh, they got this prize. Uh, it's uh, it's it's very good uh, news in China. Okay, okay. The second part is uh, uh, almost cost to the time. The second part is WS clean uh, clean house. So here I also want to list the picture how these uh, data centers in China distributed. The first thing you, you see this showed in the map, but here I want to list them in a solar earth system. You can see we have data centers in astronomy, the high level, and space science. And you can see the global change, uh, mostly for climate change here. And also in the land surface, you can see resource, renewable resources and environmental, microbiological, and cold uh, dry area. Uh, yeah, this is for Land surface for geography and also some uh, one data center for ocean uh, they uh, study and the one for geogra geographical. So you can see this picture shows a uh, data plan diversity, but uh, it's a whole system to support the the science. So I think this is our uh, <laughs> our yeah, advantage. But also, I lastly, I will, will say we also face some yeah, challenges. Okay. So how to make these uh, uh, diversities, uh, 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 these plans work together? Uh, WSIPO uh, give us comments to build a clearing house to push push this work, push more data sharing for different uh, uh, fields, for different uh, subjects. So we do this work uh, uh, in 2014. But before, but I think maybe, yeah, this is our work uh, uh, mechanism, uh, more people together. Uh, but uh, I think before this work in 2007, we have do some pilot uh, project uh, with uh, Deepen Brook. Yeah, uh, there are data portal in OWC system. We also provide the uh, five data centers uh, uh, map information to the portal. 
Uh, here is the old, uh, old portal. Yeah, uh, people can find more than 3,000 uh, data, my data information here. And now we build a new data clearing house. So uh, from the uh, 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 web information to clearing to, uh, to, uh, to get the my data information and uh, connect, connect to my data documents, yeah, uh, work together. Uh, here is the uh, my data architecture. We use, uh, we use uh, PYCSW. Use this, this tool. This tool is open, uh, open source. So, uh, uh, more catalog information can be collected and can be exchanged with other method standards. This is a, a clean house portal. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, people can select, uh, uh, people can publish data and uh, uh, search the data uh, with different uh, classification and view the data and manage the data. Okay. This is catalog information. So totally, these are the resources we have collected in this portal. More than 6,000 uh, atoms, I think. And, f and, uh, and, uh, and in the future, we think uh, the technical uh, clean house is not the last. Uh, we will build a mechanism to make all the data centers in China work together. We need uh, factories, we need, uh, uh, need, need the office work together. So finally, I want to share some trends, opportunities, and challenges. Uh, I, I, I will use 10 slides to show the trends a little bit more. The first is uh, scientific data curation. So curation is, uh, I think, is a very popular word these years. In, in, the, in the some papers, you can see data curation can be searched uh, uh, yeah, more uh, literature recent years, and uh, uh, curation is in this in this stage. Uh, in the li whole data uh, life cycle, it's in part of them, but it's very important. And second trend is uh, in big data area, uh, for e-science, data driven science, and uh, some data harbors. We 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 all know these uh, um, trends, and uh, in the two days uh, workshop. Many people talk about uh, 3V, uh, 5V, and 10V uh, for big data. But what's the, what's the idea for big data? Here, I want to share is uh, from our side, is, uh, big data is data that has not been designed. And I think big data is the data that is not specialized for all discipline. So it's not just for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, usually we do some work only in our domain. We do not pay more attention for other fields, but in big data area, I, it's different. Your uh, domain data is very good for art, for, for, for my research, so it's uh, an environment, I think. So the third is a scientific uh, data publishing model. More data papers, more journals uh, uh, accept uh, data. And in China, we also have uh, data publishing uh, uh, a paper and a journal and a depositories here. Uh, this slide shows the uh, uh, China Data Center website. People can publish data paper here. And the fourth is data management model. You can see in two, uh, since 2010, uh, uh, maybe 2011, uh, many agencies, many departments in, uh, in yeah, the developed countries published the uh, a policy. The, the the data after the project uh, should be archived, uh, should be shared. Yeah, this is trend in many developing countries now. And also, you can see uh, many good and uh, many uh, strong data centers are uh, mainly distributed uh, in uh, in uh, Europe, in America, and also Japan. So developing countries' uh, data centers are not so strong. So this is uh, uh, one uh, problem. Ah. Uh, number six is data magic model. You can see uh, at least some models here. Uh, different models, different data centers uh, have uh, different models, but uh, some of them are, are common. For example, I listed one model for German 
uh, 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 remote sensing data center. Uh, you can see this architecture is, uh, I think is good. One part is for data, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, data archiving. Yeah. You should have archiving. You should uh, have repository. And uh, one part is for service. You should, uh, need, uh, add a data, uh, uh, value added, uh, service. And, uh, uh, one part is for, uh, uh, research and development. So only have research, have archive and have services. So these data centers can work, uh, work well. Otherwise, it may be uh, just an information center. Uh, service is, uh, uh, data center construction. I think, uh, there are three important, uh, uh, uh yeah, points. One is, uh, uh, permanent records for, 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 for classification. The second is, uh, data value added service and, and the final is a business model. Okay. And this slide shows the data sharing standard and the mechanism is important for, 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 for recover the best value of, uh, of, of data from project to uh, de dissemination. The non is the uh, data policy for global and national level. Uh, be at before the end of my presentation, this slide is uh, very important for, for China community because in this month, April, uh, administrative, administrative measures for scientific data management has been approved by the state council and is hereby uh, issued to uh, to all the department. So this policy is strong uh, to collect to sh to let uh, more scientists let more department uh, share the data to to the community. So this is uh, maybe opportunity, but uh, yeah, also is challenge. I think uh, number ten, at least some world data system data centers in the world here, uh, the all of them are famous. And I think, uh, we use my data from these data centers. Uh, most, uh, uh, all of them are WS family. So they play important role in the world. So finally, the challenges. Uh, I think there are three, uh, uh, points. The first one is, uh, so, so many disciplinary, multi-disciplinary, how to merge them together to support uh, future Earth and, uh, Sustainable development goals in United Nations. So we should uh, ha have some vision to let more uh, data centers work together to support uh, these uh, 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 these work in UN. And also we should uh, uh, do more work for these data centers cooperation for regional or uh, international uh, research plan. Finally, a strong policy needs a strong uh, implementation of best practice and, and need uh, qualified, uh, uh, domain depositories and centers. Yeah, the last slide is for the, uh, regional conference in Asia and, uh, uh, Oceania area. Here is IOC workshop and I also will welcome you to, to come to the AO conference. Uh, last year is in Japan, in Kyoto, uh, it's successful, and next year will, will be, uh, be in Beijing, in April, uh, so, uh, we all institute, institute will host this, uh, this workshop, this meeting. So, so that's my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vrondo. It was very useful to have this view coming from a different region of the, of the world. I think you covered a lot of the topics that were covered by the previous speakers. Um, that's why maybe you went over time a little bit. <laughs> but I would like to use the time uh, that we have left now to ask the speakers to join um, the, the stage to have some discussion around the topics that you covered. We need to add one more chair, I think. Or I can stand, actually. I will just stand, so we have five chairs. Do you still have time? Yeah, yeah. Great. Okay, we can. <laughs> okay. You stay here. 
Okay, the reason is that I have to catch a flight, so I say I'll stay here. Uh, Five, ten minutes? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so he says, you're a lady who sits in the middle and say, I'll interrupt everyone. But anyway. Great. So let's, um, no, 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 I'll, I'll stand. So I think we had, um, in, in this panel, I think all of you covered different aspects of um, the, the themes, so the policies, infrastructure. Um, many of you talked about training. Many of you also talked um, um, about providing infrastructure services and so on. And um, m most of the talks were about the Brazilian context, so I think that's very interesting. Um, obviously, we want to look also beyond Brazil, around the region and what can be done in the region. Um, that's why also we invited John Lee, although he's coming from a completely different context, but I thought, we thought it was interesting to confront, in a way, uh, different different regions also. So um, around those topics, we would like to invite questions from, from the audience um, uh, and also try to have some uh, discussion between, between the panelists. Um, so I would like to invite the audience first for questions to the panelists. Okay. Thanks, Rory. It's maybe just a practical question that was um, triggered by Claudia's presentation. So there's a lot of emphasis on starting the whole research data management process nowadays with a data management plan. But for me, this is the wrong way to do things. We I think we should start from the other end and ask what the objectives is for the entire research data management process from the perspective of uh, four or five sets of end user communities and then design the data and the inputs and the services that we need to satisfy those requirements. And the reason I say that is that data management plans as they stand are very, very intensive to review. So this is a narrative that has to be read by a human before they can decide whether it's valid or not. And which means that it wasn't designed with some, let's say, output objective in mind, if I look at it. So mm -hmm. I'd like maybe a broader comment to think whether we shouldn't take a step back and think about what this process of research, research output management must achieve and what the role of the different actors in the system are before we start designing the data and metadata and workflows and services involved. Thanks, Vim. Hold your fire. Uh, since Claudia is leaving soon, we'll take maybe direct questions to you so that you yeah, can... Okay. Uh, so any other questions for, for Claudia more specifically? Not only for you. But not only for you, I know, yeah, but yeah. If, if any. There's one over there, Rory. And it's in the same line. I was, I was wondering. So you presented um, the FAPESB funded a lot of programs that are by nature very data intensive, and then you, you're sort of um, demanding that they draft sort of a data policy. But at the same time, you also fund many projects, and I, w I was wondering um, if you um, demand from projects to have a data policy agreement from the beginning where they get where they get granted their projects. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of similar. Okay. Other questions? There's one here. So, yeah. No, that's okay. Don't worry. So uh, Claudia and also to Leandro. So Claudia was uh, talking about the experiencing FAPESP, about establishing a network and changing culture. And we have been talking before. I was talking to other participants also. Uh, and there is a need for more um, interaction, at least within Brazil, but maybe in the, the South America region. So how could we expand our network in, in a more regional basis, so we can exchange experiences and you know, maybe build a, a regional RDA group or something like that. What mm -hmm. are your opinions about that? One more question? 
No, so let's get the panelists to think about these things and we'll start with Claudia. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, I used to be a tour guide and when people give me a microphone, I talk non-stop, so be careful. Well, you have a plane to take. I right? have a plane to take, <laughs> yes. When I was a tour guide, I had a bus to take. But anyways, um, the, the entire issue, I, I got your points. Uh, maybe I'll start with, with your question about does for past require data policies from uh, the, the, the it's you should look at it from the other way there are two uh let us say different reasons for the data management plan and i agree with you they're hard to review they are hard to to implement and they are hard to um, enforce okay um most of our international uh, partners, we have about 70 uh, international calls a year. They are already requiring data management plans as a compulsory item of any submission. And Brazilians, well, let me talk about uh, Sao Paulo State. We do not have this culture. So uh, that's why uh, we, we do not want anything else, okay? At the moment, uh, why data management plans? Because, again, there are several uh, scientific fields that have the, the whole scientific data sharing uh, culture as already ingrained culture. But most of them don't, and in Sao Paulo State, certainly most of them don't. So the idea of uh, having a data management plan together with the project, is to kind of make people start thinking of planning how what you're going to do with your data and how you're going to share it. Uh, and once we start getting more of a feedback, and we do have lots of information from the world, okay, like from RDA, from WDS, of the cultures, of the scientific trends, then we can navigate and adapt. But we could not wait for time, enough time, that's my point of view, of course, to, to start finding out what people need and how they work, so that afterwards you can build an infrastructure and then demand the plan, which is what I guess your your question was. So the plan, it's a strategy uh, to make people think about data from the beginning as they are planning a project. And it's also to make they comply with FAPESP's uh, good practices code, which has been on since 2011, and uh, the only thing it says is that data should be made public and so on and so forth. How do you do it? Why do you do this start? And, and there were no, no ways to do it. But uh, So that's, that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I would like to ask you a follow-up question on yeah. this. There are innovative ways also of funding research. Yes. And why funders are not trying to innovate here? I think that's what I guess, uh, yeah. what, what's behind Vim's question. So the, I understand, and I'm also a very, uh, an advocate for data management plans, because I think, as you said, it's not an end, it's a mean to, yeah. to make researchers think yeah. about the data management and talk with data repositories. But why do we always follow the same res recipe mm -hmm. instead of trying to innovate? An example, the Belmont Forum group, yes. which you, you might be aware, FAPAS participates yeah. in Belmont Forum. They've been experimenting this with a recent call, working with researchers to develop a plan for their research and at the same time try to address their infrastructure needs. So instead of judging them on a data management plan saying, okay, you fit all the checkboxes, get your money, do your research, and by the way, we're not going to see if you really delivered on your data implementation plan or uh, on the implementation yeah. of your data management plan, we'll work with you to make sure that while you're doing your research, the infrastructure needs that you have expressed in your research is being addressed. So we work with you to deliver, basically, that research. 
Well, um, I did not know enough. I mean, I've been part of the network of the Belmont Farm, but all I know about is by talking to one of the two chairs, which is Alberto Camara, who's not here. He's not here. <laughs> yeah, and also by reading the call. Okay, and a part of the call is these are the requirements for a data management plan, and you have to submit it. Okay, and that's all I know. And since in FAPESP's page, there is an email address, if you have any doubts, email to this email, and it goes to me, I did receive questions about the data management plan of the Belmont Farm. Okay, so you may innovate, but that's one call and one coalition. It's really great. We receive 27 to 28,000 proposals a year. There's no way we can start asking everyone what they want yeah. at the moment. I mean, I'm talking. I, I'm not officially for past, but I've, I'm kind of answering like that. Okay? I mean, I'm officially yes, but uh, I cannot answer everything. Sure. <laughs> um, any other views from the panelists on, on these yeah. questions around data management plans? I think um, I think about this question, I mean, uh, I, I see it closely to the idea that I try to foster, that it has, you must have a, a kind of global view on, on not only data um, access, but data usage. So how is going, how data is going to be used, so, so to plan that beforehand, so that you know how you want to publish the data, so it can be consumed. Uh, Senior-wise, I think also, when, when, when a group tries to uh, put up a plan on developing in silico research, uh, they should also look to what's around. So it, how can I take advantage of all the technology that's being already developed and not restarting the wheel somehow differently than it should be done? And, and this calls for a more uh, global plan in terms of, I mean, I'm a researcher, so I'm concerned with the technology that goes um, behind the scenes. So then I think if you're thinking about to, to change to a data-oriented society, what's the infrastructure and technology that should sustain the, 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 the research that we're doing? And so looking vertically through each project, it's almost impossible to have this global view. So maybe something like technical point of view of WDS, not legal, but technical, should also, in my point of view, work, be working on establishing and guiding uh, how this technology, this kind of common pipeline should be designed, what are the tools available, what are the implementations already uh, existent, so that those projects just take advantage of that. So I, I, I'm thinking that we should be in, in a situation where we are um, already in a second stage, in a second stage where there is exi a lot of things that are done, but we, we must must do in a way that the next things will be better done than they have been done before. Mm -hmm. And secondly, they should be integratable. And being integrated is a huge problem. So if you start popping up different data sets, each one with its own semantics and, uh, and, and idiosyncrasies, so it's, be, uh, it's going to be a nightmare to, to link those two things together. So I think this is my, yeah. Thank you. So one thing. Uh, Thinking from a user perspective, I'd like to elaborate something that I mentioned that uh, uh, some researchers view that data can be a resource also for the future. So mm -hmm. it's a, another level of, of, of thinking about the user perspective though. So, so there are the users that are here and then there are the users that are not here. Well, one problem, additional problem with data different from the example I gave of old specimen uh, lying on a jar that can be used for DNA analysis is because data is always a snapshot. So it, it's harder still to, to, to look what we're going to preserve. There is, of course, this, this, the famous co co uh, quote from Norbert Wiener, the best mo material model of a cat is another cat and preferably the same cat. So the same thing happens perhaps with the data. You, you, you have to make a conscious decision what you're preserving and what you're not preserving and that's an additional challenge. So yes, I think that's a good, mm -hmm. good way to think mm -hmm. a little bit beyond what your specific needs and perhaps put something more there that you're not immediately know how it's going to be used. Any other views from the panel? Oh, just a comment. I think uh, instead of uh, deciding what to preserve or not, I'm, I think if you have 
all data preservative, all data. And we also have another aspect to enable uh, the reproducibility of, of the experiments and also to assure that what the other research is, is publishing, that that's okay. So um, uh, I think we should have all data, not to choose what to preserve. Mm -hmm. Questions from the audience? I have a little <coughs> Sorry. Can we comment. Anybody was yep. going to ask a question? Yeah, go ahead if you have a comment. Um, oh, okay. I, I also have a comment about uh, what he said, what you said about uh, uh, guiding you through thinking your data, okay? That's, for instance, a British policy with data curation centers. Or when you have data librarians that have been trained to babysit the scientists, if, if I may use a word, or at least uh, they are trained to help you out, then you can think innovatively. And you must remember the Belmont Forum is composed of lots of countries that have a long data tradition, okay? Uh, we do have a few, as I said before, and I think you guys from Brazil will, will agree with me, just a few communities of researchers that have this kind of, of culture, including the social scientists, okay, of, you know, I have to make a data plan, I have to care for my data, and so on and so forth, I have to preserve and share it, but we don't have trained librarians, we don't have trained IT staff. We don't have data, scientific data repositories. I mean, we not not in a, in a, uh, generic ones. Okay, so we are starting from zero, and the only way uh, to start from zero is to follow other peoples and that have this experience and try to innovate in the middle. Okay, but that's just to answer your question. I'm sorry. We have a question here. Uh, so only you showed. Uh, some examples of repositories in China where actually data publication is part of the repository process. So in a sense, the author of the data gets some credit for their, for their work by publishing the data through a repository, which is an interesting model. It's quasi, you know, it's almost like science, science data or the, some of these new publications that are arising in terms of data publication. Uh, my question for the panel is related to whether those kinds of opportunities exist through any uh, repositories or data publications that are specific to Latin America and secondly, or developed in Latin America, let me put it that way. And then secondly, whether data publication is something that is now considered part of a tenure process that uh, academics might get credit for working on a large database that then gets uh, published in one of these repositories or somewhere else internationally, and therefore it goes towards their tenure review. Who wants to get this one? The answer is no. I think we were discussing this during lunch somehow. I mean, uh, so um, the the meritocracy in Brazil is mostly in research linked by how much you publish and where you do publish, but not the data. I mean, um, and um, the the fact that you, it, it's a huge, so actually I'll tell you a story. So I just received a, a, a presentation that was given yesterday in a famous conference in our area. And this is by someone that's a Turing Award. Turing Award is like the Nobel Prize in computer science. And this, this guy called, his, his name is Michael Stonebreaker. Michael Stonebreaker is saying that, exactly, that when he, he, he gave, he had his PhD, he had no paper. So he, he had his PhD in 75, I guess, without a single paper. Now, now he was, he was a, from MIT. And he was the, the, the main PI, let's say, of English. English was the precedent of Postgres. So if you use Postgres today in an application, this is due to this guy. So, and in most of his career was dedicated to developing systems. And his discussion was exactly that, how, how much value. Eventually he, he got this, this Turing Award, but that was, has been a struggle. So many people thought that he had, he should have won this long before. 
So anyway, just uh, illustrating with this story that the same thing happens uh, not only in Brazil but uh, everywhere where th there are some papers so we take, for instance, some journals like Oxford Databases, for instance. Is, um, I think the impact factor of uh, Oxford Databases is 5 dot something, which in computer science is a lot. So computer science impact factor is around, around 1 something, and 2, 3, 4. So there, there are signals that there are some um, rewarding uh, towards uh, publishing um, data, but um, that's far away from actually our the way at least in Latin America I think we are we've been uh, evaluated. Uh, you want to address this as well? Yes, yes, and and I think this brings to what you were asking about having a global discussion because I feel that's 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 not particularly a, a, a Brazilian problem. I mean, this this is a global problem at this point. I mean, it's not particular to us not to address this data production as part of evaluation and, and grants and, and, and career opportunities and whatever. And, uh, uh, and part of the thing is, if I have uh, some guilt in that, and when you do some, some of us, when you do some research that use impact factors and other things to evaluate a country or area or etc. etc., this goes down to people trying to evaluate uh, 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 researchers in the same way, and it's, that's a huge mistake. It's the same thing we use, of course, a uh, life expectancy to evaluate. Uh, 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 the health of a country, mm -hmm. but we are not expected to say if you are above a country's life expectancy does not mean that you're dead. So, so, so that's what we do in science. <laughs> that's exactly what we do in science, and we should stop that. It's a nice way. analogy, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're, we're running out of time, but I have a final question to the panel. How far are we from having a research data policy in Brazil? <laughs> well, talk about an incendiary question there. Well, I, I'll be very blunt and say uh, the, the, the press is calling our government a uh, uh, lame duck government. Pato Manco or Pato Rengo, and uh, I, I would I wouldn't I would, I would have well for those who understand in the in the United States uh, political landscape, this called a government that uh, has in its in its final months of government, and so I wouldn't give high hopes of having of having uh, uh, anything in 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 the next few months. On the other hand, we have uh, the Brazilian government is composed of many uh, 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 what the economists call a very strong uh, civil servant corporation. So uh, uh, we always we are always working, sometimes overworking, and so we'll be working towards that. But uh, uh, I don't know how long we will be. I mean, we have we have strong institutions like IBIC, the the Brazilian Institute of scientific and technologies formation that are doing lots of work on that uh, and, and collaboration with RNP and LMCC, perhaps we'll find something, but uh, I wouldn't say that's something that will be coming up in the next few months. Thank you. Yeah, please, Claudia. Okay, um, I just realized that I missed Deborah's uh, question on how to establish uh, a network, and that's something we could, I mean, this was a great event. Right, and I thank the people that organized it. At least I loved it, and I'm sure everybody is here until now because you're all loving yeah. it. Uh, and uh, lots of new ideas appeared, including this one of uh, maybe setting up an RDA office in in Latin America, or South America. And uh, by the way, I was much impressed by the the Chinese uh, presentation with so many centers, and I wondered how. And actually, that's a question I have. How um, and isn't um, I'm asking you a question, if I may. How how uh, do you do you collaborate among these centers? The you show different WDS uh, centers. Is there any kind of collaboration across centers to share data, to share expertise, or uh, how how do you do that? Oh, oh no! You have to make it short. You have, have to make it short. I have to take a plane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not in 1988, 
eight, uh, there are nine WC data centers in China. Okay? It's called uh, called WC. So 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 we have a national committee to to merge all the data centers together. And but uh, after the new WPS system, they separate. Separate, but we have the uh, traditional, yeah, uh, relationship. We, 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 all the data centers uh, in a uh, earth system umbrella. You can see the, we also lost the two important data centers at present. One is meteorology, one is seismology. Mm -hmm. They are older members in the, um, older in the in 1980s. So we have this history. So, so you can see we can work together. No problem. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the last point about from Claudia was a very good segue to the last part of the workshop where we will be discussing the next steps. So please join me in thanking the panel. Oh, there's one. Okay. Everybody's eager to talk. That's great. <laughs> okay. Please go ahead. Uh, okay. Just a final remark. Uh, when we launched the survey that we presented, I was a, a bit skeptical about the number of, of people interested in, in answering the survey. And I got very, uh, very impressed with more than 1,600 researchers. Mm -hmm. they, they declare yeah. interest in participating in a mailing Follow list. Survey. And so we have a, a critical mass uh, identified mm -hmm. and we can uh, work together with FAPESP or in Brap, uh, big to, to, to build a community here around this. Absolutely, that's a very, very positive uh, development. So thank you very much. Thank Join you. me in thanking the panel. And Claudia can catch her plane <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> thank you very much. But, but don't go away, people, because you haven't finished. Claudia may be allowed to escape, but we've got another half hour. Sit. <laughs> yeah, we, we need to set up there as well. I mean, it's just going to be whatever. Yes, yes, 15 minutes we are. So, so Claudia gave us a, a bit of a brief introduction there into what we're going to try and do in the next 10 minutes which is to get some feedback from you about what the future is going to be, how we follow up on the energy that's been generated in these last couple of days. And normally people stand up here and say, what are you going to do? But I just wanted to say that the WDS uh, uh, Scientific Committee is meeting in the next couple of days, so now is also your chance to ask us to do something for you. But what I'd like you to think about here is what are the next steps now? How do you take things forward in Latin America? Stop taking photographs. Right. Who's going to say something first? We all want to go home. No, come on. What do you want to do next? <laughs> okay. Good. Yes. You go. Oh, well. I, I can start. It's, it's, it doesn't mean I'm going to be what I'm going to do. Huh? I'm, I'm going to start um, just to. <laughs> I think. Well, I I I have the same impression. You know, you know, uh, we came to this meeting um, kind of a small group, and really, I think that this, there is a momentum from various parts, uh, from the basic things. Also, one to change experience, and there everyone is starting in Latin America in a pilot. Data management plan started just in Conicet in Argentina and it's finished the proposal just uh, the end of uh, May, no, April are the results. So things are moving everywhere, kind of uh, trying to learn from each other. That's, it's a momentum. And if it is a momentum, you know, I, I believe uh, everyone has, can put certain amount of things on the table to help uh, declaring what you say, what we're going to do. What, at least from La Referencia for us, it's clear that we will continue technology, Harvester, supporting international guidelines for metadata, respecting disciplines, metadata are working to find the best way to make interoperable system. As there are international data networks, I believe uh, many of us, and I say as a region, as countries, want to just collect what we have produced the metadata and what data is about us. Uh, not only for the researcher, uh, for our citizens. When you see PubMed, 
and uh, I love Pamela as <laughs> well. That is not for researcher at the end. It's uh, 50% or 60% of the queries are from nurses, uh, citizens. Uh, just start to find uh, the way to justify also what we are doing for our people. Sounds very kind of, huh? but this is the time to uh, deal with social problems that I always wonder if we live in crisis or we live in always crisis and normality is sometimes uh, the section, but, I think, but that's I think my we're always living in crisis. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I'm from Mubikti, and I think that uh, this meeting was uh, fantastic uh, to know some people that are working with this uh, subject. And I think that our institute has a lot of what to do have to has to uh, to know and to think about the any, all the kinds of collaboration with these groups and start to think uh, network the network the Brazilian network uh, to um, exchange experiences good practice and uh, to is uh, to stay in touch. I think that it was the first step and the, the very important first step in us and for us, the EBICT, we have a lot of work to do together, please, always together. Any other comments or perspectives on that? How do you do it practically? What what are the practical steps to take this forward? Because it's all very well to go home thinking, wow, but, 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 but how do you do this practically? Somebody was talking about creating networks. Yeah. Can, can I? Oh, here, here. Okay, I thought there was somebody here as well. Okay. Uh, so, Sandy, um, perhaps one thing that could be done is to, if everybody agrees, to share the list of participants here so we can reach them or perhaps their email too. There is something that we were talking about, uh, us from Embrapa, we were talking to, to Ingrid and Leslie, it was about the outputs of RDA. There is one that is in Portuguese that's about the 23 uh, uh, principles for librarians and maybe that's something that we can work on and uh, we were thinking about uh, making a, a webinar about that, so we can, it, it's important for us to reach the the, audi the audience that can be interested on, on something like that. Okay, so two things there. Um, that's talking about sharing the presentations from this meeting as well, so that that will be done, right? And the participants list. That's a bit more difficult to do. We cannot expose something here necessarily on the web, but we can facilitate this. Uh, we can publish a list of names and then provide contact with request. Yeah. And then the other word, you said the fatal word webinar. So WGS does run webinars. And if there are some people here who would like to volunteer to organize a webinar that's relevant to you, and it can be in Portuguese or Spanish or anything else, you know, if you want to do that to reach out to your community, then let us know. Tell Mustafa he wants to say, say stop, but I'm not going to let him. Um, that's all right, isn't it, Mustafa? We can have some webinars if there are some volunteers. Uh, absolutely. And actually, I, I wanted to use a, an example that happened recently um, in, in Australia um, and and other uh, organizations in Australia organized a webinar where they shared experiences of data repositories in Australia which went through the core trust seal uh, certification process. Actually, they put together, they provided a grant to a number of data repositories uh, to try the core trust seal certification and then they gathered the experiences of these and exposed them through a webinar. So I was wondering if this is something also that could be done. Of course, WDS has no money, so we cannot provide funding, but uh, very exactly. That, that, that's the kind of experience that is, that's proven very useful in a country like Australia, so um, it could be replicated in, in other countries. That's the, the message. 
So, so if there's anybody who's keen to push that for any particular area, then talk to us about it and we can set something up and that would be really good. Are there some other ideas of things that you want to do to come forward? Yeah, I, uh, um, there is here in this meeting some members of the Brazilian Academy of Science. Mm -hmm. Then we met uh, the, during the lunch with Marcus, that is the person that care about international affairs of the Academy. And we try to have idea to organize a working group yeah, of the Academy to make a more clear position. Then Marcus, we arrange a meeting with the president of the Academy next week possibly, then to really make official this action. No? Uh, the idea is to include the other people in the group, to have uh, maybe eight, ten people, yeah, with different backgrounds, different experience, and try to set up an agenda in the academy about data, yeah, and maybe organize later a workshop, yeah, and to produce a position paper, yeah, to to the academy to have a more clear position in this topic, yeah, in, at least to cover in Brazil, yeah. As the academy is member of the uh, Latin America and the others, yeah, uh, association like ICSU, like uh, IANAS, IANAS, yeah, maybe could it, uh, also act, yeah, to try to to speed and to inform other academies to be involved in this movement. But I don't know if it, what. It, Excuse me, um, I would ask you in this effort you are um, planning to do, possibly to include um, at least an idea uh, to have or to host an RDA plenary here in Brazil, maybe, and to at least to put more, more people in contact to different working groups and maybe. Um, I, I, how, how can I say, um, drop a seed for something like the network as they were was suggesting and as like you are working for. So I'm not in the status of do this, but I would like to ask you for do this for us. Um, so just to, to echo what has been said, I, I think this is a great idea, of course, and um, we're hosting International Data Week every two years, and International Data Week brings together Research Data Alliance, the World Data System, CoData, and all organizations really uh, operating in this field of data management. It would be, the, ne the next step actually would be really uh, um, great if the, the next International Data Week is hosted in the region. So this is a, this is a call actually <laughs> to the community here in the region so that International Data Week after Africa moves to Latin America and the Caribbean, so yeah, we need more votes. <laughs> but let's say that is happening this year in Botswana, and I hope we're going to see a lot of people who were in this room at International Data Week because I think that's the place to raise the flag. And then just to respond to the Brazilian Academy, I think that's a fantastic idea. But when you've had your meeting with the Brazilian Academy, can you make sure that it goes out to all the other academies in Latin America, and I'm sure Ianis would be really helpful with that because I think, you know, an Ixu Rolak as well, yes. Would, is there an Ixu? Sorry, I haven't said hello yet. Is there an Ixu Rolak position on this? Would you like to comment? That floor is just behind you. Thank you. Well, actually, we have been thinking and uh, taking advantage of these discussions and ideas. And uh, we want uh, to develop uh, a workshop in uh, covering uh, uh, Central America and Caribbean countries. And uh, uh, we are planning this activity in Panama. And the idea is... Uh, I mean to spread and to uh, send messages, but concrete messages to each one of the countries uh, about uh, these possibilities of utilizing these uh, uh, weapons to 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 increase 
and to go deeper into specific uh, scientific area in which they are involved. And uh, still, this is a, a very new idea, but uh, we are planning to organize this for the, for February, and uh, you will know about. And we would like to have your support in terms of, uh, I mean, methodology for this type of activity and uh, some other help. Uh, I mean, intellectual help from you. We are not ask, we are not asking for money because <laughs> probably. But this is something we have been talking with uh, Panama that will 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 be the sponsor of this uh, the Panamanian government. Thank you. Okay, but but at the same time, and this is a, an immediate sort of goal you have. But if there's a wider Latin American initiative linking into whatever comes out of the academies, then Ixirolac is the obvious. Yeah. Immediate link point to make that we are, connection. We are in close contact and we are working together for different activities. Therefore, I, I think what this is really important that all of these different bodies are brought together so that the initiatives are tied together. That's what I'm seeing come out of the energy from this. Are, are there any other things that people would like to raise in terms of things that you want to see done in the next year to keep the momentum going? No? Then we'll turn it over to Alfredo. Alfredo, do you want to? Okay. Back shortly. Yeah. Back shortly. Yeah, just uh, first of all, to inform that we will issue certificates for, uh, for the speakers and for people who attend the meeting. Uh, if it's necessary, please demand you can send a certificate. And, uh, this, uh, as it have, uh, have already been said, this meeting was impressive and it was a very cooperative work of many, many institutions and persons to turn, that turned it possible. Uh, so I would like to, to point especially the ICSU, ICSU WDS, the Brazilian Academy of Science, uh, and especially Marcos, a cortesão, who is here, Vitor Vieira, I don't know if he is here, the people there responsible for the, for the microphone and for the projection. <laughs> and the, of course, the Museum of uh, Tomorrow, many institutions like Yamas, IAI, the Inter-American Network of, uh, no, Inter-American Institute for Research on Global Change, the Ministry of Science, Te Technology, Innovation and Communication, uh, Ixu Holak, that was very important partner, uh, Ibikt is here, represented RNP, LNCC, IRD, and many also many people, the people all, all the group we had a very important group to uh, to organize the the of the organizing committee that work hard on this. Uh, ah, I saw the Anclinio. Many of you had the support of Rani. Thank you very much. And And I would like to, to finish the thanks with a special thank to Mustafa Mukrain. Uh, here he was really the person who worked a lot and turned possible this meeting. So we, we all thank you very much, Mustafa. Thank you. But we have to say, Alfredo was the person who thought about having this meeting here and nagged us all until it happened. So thank you, Alfredo. And for people from outside Rio, so we wish a very safe and nice travel back home. And for people who 
will remain with you. We sure we will meet very, very soon. So, so thank you very much. Thank you.